Our next speaker is Paul Kohlhaas. Hello, Paul. So Paul is the founder and CEO of Molecule Protocol and one of the key players in the token engineering ecosystem as well, um, researching and um, doing meetups, spreading the word on curation markets and bonding curves. Um, and in your talk, you'll explore bonding curves for funding R&D in the Molecule case and the legal and practical challenges resulting from such a design. Looking forward. Welcome, Paul. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Super. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, yeah, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's been an incredible week. Um, and I've really been looking forward to this event to really kind of deep dive with you guys into some of the, the legal and token engineering designs that we've been working on. Um, so maybe a little bit of background uh, about myself. Uh, I, I originally studied economics and, and politics. Um, and ever before that, got really fascinated about the global pharmaceutical system. Uh, I think it's one of the really last big... Well, we have many broken systems on our planet, but um, if you look at the incentives in pharma and the effect that it has on global GDP and on our global healthcare uh, system, um, I think it's one area where we can really innovate and where we really need to innovate. Um, and I think in a, in a similar sense as with... So like, if you think about blockchain networks, um, decentralization is a very important aspect. And we'll see, we're seeing huge advances in bioengineering at the moment. Um, and I think in the same way that uh, there's a large discussion going on around the monopolization of, um, of artificial intelligence networks, I think we really need to think, cool, how can we apply this in, in drug development and bioengineering so that we don't end up in, similar, um, in a similar monopolized ecosystem? Cool, so before jumping into like the depth of token engineering within Molecule, I just want to describe the problem to you that we're, that we're really trying to tackle here. Um, so over the, past, over the past 20 to 30 years, drug development has become exponentially more expensive and, and hard. Um, and so currently it costs about two and a half billion dollars to bring a single new drug to market. Uh, it's extremely slow, it takes 10 to 12 years um, for the FDA to approve a new treatment. Um, and if we think about capitalism, capitalism, we can say, cool, all of that is fine as long as drugs actually make it to market and, and people are cured. But uh, it's also increasingly unprofitable for, for pharma um, or biotech to kind of to pursue this. Um, so it's projected that the internal rate of return of investment in pharma R&D is projected to hit 0% in 2020, which means economically most of these giant pharmaceutical companies would be better off cutting R&D completely. Um, so what we have in pharma today is a really broken incentive engine um, and a very, very long development cycle. Um, and we look at this from a, like, a very, like a very basic statement. Um, if you think how pharma works today, it's very close to how software development worked in the, in the early 90s to mid 90s. Um, so very monopolistic, very kind of large uh, corporate players that take drugs through these like last final stages to market. Um, so. Drug development is kind of where software development was 30 to 40 years ago. Um, and it's really because of how incentives are structured in that system. So incentives, and this is not just the case for, for drug development, but also uh, in other areas where intellectual property is still the key value driver. Um, so patents and intellectual property by design disincentivize collaboration uh, because they create a monopoly. So this, this pricing monopoly that, that an entity is granted once they bring a new drug to market. Um, and that essentially creates very closed source research and development um, systems. So what happened in open source software in the 90s was new licensing frameworks moved software development away from patents and into open source licensing frameworks uh, that allowed people to develop new business models that really drove collaboration between different industry players. So the Linux Foundation is one of the best examples of like a, a non-profit entity that started driving these new designs forward. Um, and I think we in the blockchain space, or like I'm, I'm saying we, um, we in the blockchain space, I think we've learned a lot of those designs. So if you look at designs like the Ethereum Foundation, they're structured in a very, very similar way. Imagine Ethereum had been like patented or like, I mean, we see this again and again that like big banks in the, in the blockchain space are still patenting uh, new blockchain designs, um, and everyone is always shaking their head. But you have to think, many other industries still completely operate in that way. Um, 
another big problem that comes with that now is that negative data is never published. And that leads to, or is very seldomly published, and that leads to a reproducibility crisis, not just in pharma, but in the broader sciences. So imagine now, if, I'm, if I have a patented compound or even a patented program, and we find out that, that's, that the compound doesn't work, or let's say the program is extremely buggy, well, if, if, we, if we want to take the program to market, we're still we're gonna fix all of those bugs. But if it's a drug, for example, we're not actually, maybe we don't want to show some of the negative data. Uh, and this has happened in drug development over and over again. Like, um, out of let's say a hundred uh, trials that are run, um, you only want to re like essentially release the good ones because why should you show the world that you're developing something that, that isn't working? Um, and so open source development really turns that on its head. So for example, in Ethereum today, there are economic incentives to, to show bugs. Um, and I mean, one of, the, one of the easiest way to do that is by actually by exploiting a bug in the Ethereum network, I can negatively influence the price and I can gain from that uh, from that um, from that price arbitrage. Um, so, and, and the last point, uh, IP and patents are one of the last big areas that are extremely illiquid. Uh, so, to date, we haven't seen any kind of liquidization of these of these assets, even though they hold so much economic value. So, if I bring, a, if I, for example, successfully bring a new cancer therapeutic to market, that intellectual property can be valued upwards of $100 billion, just because it has such a long, it has a, a long expiration time. And essentially, what's priced into that are all the future revenue streams. So, what do we need? We need new incentives uh, and really new solutions that can, that can drive stakeholder collaboration. Um, and so what we've been working on at Molecule is really trying to design a system that unites incentives between the different participants in the pharmaceutical and biotech ecosystem. So from patients to universities to larger corporates. Uh, and really trying to combine these two methods. methods. One of them is open source R&D and the other is, is token economics. Um, so this is the typical drug development process today. You move through these different development stages, discovery, preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, and below you kind of have typical innovation cycles within companies where you have a lot of ideas to begin with and then you kind of narrow it down. And when I first heard about curation markets in like early, no, it was like mid-2016, end of 2016, Simon, Simon de la Rouvier started working on this concept called meme markets where essentially if you think about how memes are chosen on the internet, you have people post memes to different sites and then some of them get upvoted, other get downvoted and somehow a meme goes viral. Um, development processes are very similar in that sense. In, and in drug development, you start with a lot of molecules that have potential, and then the market narrows it down. Um, and so this is this is when we first started thinking about applying the concept of curation markets in uh, in this use case. So, enter curation markets and bonding curves. I'm assuming most of you know or have a, a basic understanding of what bonding curves are. Um, so I won't go too deep, but they're essentially uh, incentive coordination tools. Um, a bonding curve is an autonomous market maker that we can use to price illiquid assets. Um, and they really provide new financing and funding mechanisms. Um, and they also reduce information asymmetry. So and maybe as a super small recap for anyone who doesn't know, so a bonding curve is basically a smart contract that I can deploy um, that enables me, that um, creates a continuous issuance of tokens for a specific objective. So anyone at any time can always trade with that contract by sending it funds and, return, and, and receiving tokens, and vice versa, sending it tokens and receiving funds. And the pricing in between that is uh, structured via an algorithm. So this is the most typical, um, kind of typical depiction, which is just a quadratic curve. And what we can use these now is really get people and systems to behave in new ways. Um, so one, uh, wait, and the other example that I want to make is, so we, in, in a token engineering sense, we now combine this with a concept called a non-fungible token. Um, so IP, intellectual property, in the most basic sense, is usually based on patents and proprietary data as a timestamped claim. And so we take the information, the data, in a patent or in a new piece of IP, and we attach that to a non-fungible token. Um, and what we then do, and this was a concept that was first uh, spearheaded by Billy Rennenkamp in early 2018, um, is a concept called a refungible. So we set the owner address of that, of that NFT to uh, a bonding curve. So now the bonding curve fully controls that intellectual property asset. Um, of course, there's still legal implications to, um, to play into this, but that's, that's the basic concept. So uh, this was first proposed, for, for example, to trade shares and attention in a crypto kitty, but we can obviously also trade shares and attention now in a, in a pharmaceutical patent. Um, so what happens now once we create these open markets for, for IP? 
you kind of have to think back um, back to this picture. We now we can take each of these assets that are in an early stage development process, we attach it to a non-fungible token, so now it's unique, and then we create a market for each asset. So now different market participants can start curating information and releasing information about the assets because they can positively or negatively influence, this, influence their prices. Um, so in a very basic sense, uh, this is also, in this case, Bonnier curves have a lot of similarities with prediction markets to some extent because they curate information. So positive data is likely to increase the price of the asset, negative data is likely to decrease the price of the asset. Um, the market participants now have an incentive to reveal data, to analyze the data that other participants release, um, and to place their bets accordingly. Um, so in the concept of science, I think this is really interesting because now uh, this can also boost peer review and take peer review to another level because now um, each, each data set that is released is likely to be analyzed by another participant who might have a differing position and might correspondingly want to react and say, no, I think in your study this and this wasn't correct um, because look at these properties here, for example. Uh, it's really interesting as well because if we have these open markets now, what are the implications for insider trading? Is insider trading in this context still a thing? Like, in our case now, scientific data can become insider trading information or financial, financially valuable information, um, which I think is, is really interesting as a concept. Cool. So what's really new with bonding curves? So they provide immediate liquidity uh, by creating a primary public market maker to issue buy and sell tokens. Um, as a side note, and we'll get to more legal stuff just now, so this contravenes most securities laws. So most securities laws, by definition, have a lock-in period. Uh, if you do, at least if you do um, Reg D or Reg C exempt uh, securities offerings, um, the lock-in period tends to be three to, to 12 months. Um, so bonding curves by design just topple that regulation to begin with, so it's something to consider. Um, but what they really enable us to do is they create markets where um, it was previously completely impossible to create a market for it, like, like a meme. Um, so anything that is a liquid or hard to price. Um, they also enable trustless price discovery and new funding models, um, for example, through taxation schemes. Um, but also consider that this creates revenue model implications. So if we put, for example, a, tech, a tax on a bonding curve, which um, a lot of DAOs are currently kind of experimenting with, uh, there's a project called Continuous Organizations, that really tries to, um, so essentially what, for anyone who doesn't know is if you put a tax on a bonding curve, uh, you essentially have t a different buy and, and, uh, and sell curve. Um, but if you're now using that as a revenue model, that also has VAT implications, uh, which is interesting. Um, so we've kind of tried to think around what are existing legal models like that we have in our world that we can apply to this, and one is a, is a market maker. Uh, and I have a very simple definition here. You can go much deeper into like the legal definitions of a market maker in financial markets as a market maker or liquidity provider as a company or an individual that quotes both a buy and a sell price in a financial instrument or commodity held in inventory, hoping to make a profit on the bid, offer, spread, or turn. Um, so market makers are an existing thing. Um, and so we can analyze what, how, how autonomous market makers or bonding curves are different from that. And we can learn quite a few things. Um, so, uh, just looking at the bottom definition, so first of all, a, a, a bonding curve is not a company or an individual, it's an autonomous smart contract. Uh, it does quote a buy and a sell price at all times. It doesn't have to be the, a financial instrument or commodity, we now know it can be pretty much anything that we want it to be. It holds whatever it sells in an inventory, but it also doesn't hope to make a profit uh, on the bid offer or, or spread. Um, so that's a there's a lot of differences to the only definition that we have in our legal world already. Um, this is kind of a, a taxonomy of the different design parameters um, that kind of I, I drew out, I think about half a year ago. Uh, and the more people started exploring bonding curves, the more they really realized that there's an extremely wide set of parameters that we can fine tune. And then going into token engineering and, and simulation, we really need to simulate what these different parameters do once we start tuning them. Um, because what bonding curves really just are their programs and we can program them in whatever way you want. And just to run through like very briefly, you can change the issuance in a token bonding curve. So we could issue NFTs through a bonding curve, like artworks that are autonomously issued. Uh, we can change the token supply. 
Uh, a lot of uh, bonding curves designs initially assumed infinite token issuance, for example. We can also make cap token issuance have different stages of, of a sale. Um, we can ha use different forms of collateral. So most bonding curves initially assumed using ether as the base collateral. We can also use die. Uh, we can stake a different asset into the curve, uh, use a different function, um, and price the curve accordingly. The biggest legal implications come both from the asset that is in a curve, um, as well as how we structure um, the pricing. Um, so the asset is normally like, what, the, what, what does this curve actually represent? Uh, is it a security? Are we selling a membership? Are we selling a service level agreement? Uh, and the pricing is if we have different buy and sell structures. Because I could make a very pure bonding curve that only kind of measures interest in this asset. But I can also kind of now start creating these almost these revenue models where a central entity gets revenue from each buy and sell that gets made through the curve. So there's huge, huge differences here uh, in terms of how this might be treated by the, by the law. And so something really important is all of our engineering and design choices have really profound legal implications. Uh, and this is what, uh, what the previous speaker also said, which I thought was really great. Consider like uh, a DAO that doesn't have any legal framework might mean that it's unlimited liability for all of its members, which is which is a really scary, crazy thing to think of in in like the the real legal world. Um, cool. So, what are some of the legal classifications that we can look into? And this is a fully non-exhaustive list, but uh, one um, one simple way to look at it are if you structure them as donations. So the tokens are pure donations, and they don't have any backing into the real world. And then you're in, in gift law. Um, this could be used for Kickstarter. It could be used for certain DAOs. It could be used for grants. The other one is gambling and predictions. Then you're in gaming law. Um, meme lords, for example, I think one of the first uh, like live implementations of, of testing bonding curves would most likely be in gaming law. Um, then different prediction markets, things like FOMO 3D. Uh, another big one, I think, and payment for services will be a really big area, I think, because we can now structure various um, service agreements through bonding curves. Um, this could be, for example, concert tickets, it could be licenses, it could be um, event tickets, it could be service agreements, uh, and then you're in contract law. Remember, in contract law, you most likely have VAT implications from the tokens that you're selling there, then membership, um, then your membership law. So Comet Stack, for example, is, is mostly looking at a membership model. Other DAOs are looking at that as well. Um, be, be aware that if you're in membership law, but you attach profit incentives to it, then you're probably in a collective investment scheme, and then you're probably a security. Um, so those are all things to consider. And the last one are assets and securities. And then you're obviously in securities law. Um, and so. This is the area that we've been mostly thinking about because as soon as you deal with intellectual property, you're actually dealing with the rights that are attached to that IP. Um, and how can you how can you structure that? So, I have two kind of two examples that I quickly want to um, go through with you. The one is kind of the purest example that we've been working with with Marlokin. This is obviously extremely oversimplified, uh, but so a bonded market for intellectual property, the tokens in that are issued through this bonding curve represent ownership in in the intellectual property. Um, and now, thinking back to the incentives again, we could have multiple parties now developing this intellectual property and receiving stake in the intellectual property through their contributions. Um, the intellectual property is moved into a special purpose vehicle, so it's moved into a separate entity to wherever it was before. Uh, we could then say a 10% tax is applied to all purchases, and that tax goes, goes directly into that real world special purpose vehicle. Um, these tokens are 100% securities. Um, we essentially, you're securitizing the future royalty streams that could come out of those tokens. So let's say at some point down the line, I hold one of these tokens and I would receive almost like dividend payments um, for when this drug comes to market. Um, remember as well, in this case, if you put this on a bonding curve, all contributions would need to be KYC'd. Um, they would also need to be whitelisted. Um, and here, participants uh, acquire rights in an investment contract. Really, that represents rights to those royalties. Um, one more example. One more. Okay, and the other one is, um, for example, would be an example of a donation curve. And this is what we're really pioneering with our alpha launch that's coming up in uh, early October. So in our alpha launch, um, all tokens would represent donations to a project. Um, in this, in our case, it's, uh, it's three um, early stage research projects. And then what you say is a 20% tax is applied to all of those contributions to fund a specific project. 
Uh, and once the curve fills up, so there's a limited issuance, once the curve fills up, at the end, all the funds are redistributed between the participants minus those 20%. So this is really now like an incentive game. Um, and here the participants essentially gamble on the success of a donation campaign through a bonding curve. Um, so the early participants stand to win back a part of their contribution or maybe even make a small return. Um, but this really depends on their own efforts. Um, and the token itself, in this case, represents the value of the curve collateral, so the value of all of the collateral that has been staked in, um, as well as a memento of the project, or in particular cases, you can also bake in project, uh, project rewards. We on? <laughs> okay, maybe one last thing that I wanna say is uh, we've been working a lot with block science to engineer uh, incentives and simulate incentives exactly for, for use cases like this. Um, and I think there's going to be a workshop later on uh, CADCAD, which is a specific tool. And um, here we can, for example, we can, we can measure what returns would be based on like different stages of, of contributions. Um, we can measure what tax rates kind of have what incentives. So we found out, for example, that 19% of all contributors in a, at a tax rate of 20% can st stand to break even or make a small ROI. Uh, we've also looked at dynamic tax rates, so ranging them from 5% to 20%. Um, in this case, obviously the ROI um, changes. And then we've really looked at the desired ROI um, that we want and then defined the tax rate based on that. So it's been a really incredible tool for us to work with and to test a lot of these new uh, behavior patterns that we're, that we're building here. Um, as a last point, I want to say it's super, super early days, so simulation in uh, simulating these designs and really testing different parameters is extremely important. And then I think it's, so, it's really early, and in that case, we also need to consider a lot of the things that we're doing as um, experiments and be careful not to kind of venture too far down the legal rabbit hole too early, um, but really choose use cases that we can easily alter and, um, and experiment with. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Um, thanks also for mentioning CatCat tool. So we will dive deeper into simulations and engineering tools, framework, processes um, in the afternoon um, where we have several use cases and also, as mentioned, the CatCat introduction workshop where you can try yourself and see how simulations work. In this case, with Clover's network use case. And I guess there are also examples online uh, from the bonding curve um, simulation at Molecule. Um, so again, sign up to our newsletter. We will be happy to share material and links related to that. Mm -hmm.